Welcome to another episode of Reason to Doubt with Jordan and Jared, your source for all things skeptical. Uh, I'm Jordan, and this is Jared on the other side. Today, we're going to be talking about the Shroud of Turin. Very exciting episode. Uh, the Shroud of Turin is not only the alleged burial shroud of Jesus Christ, whose birthday was just a few days ago, but it is allegedly irrefutable proof that Jesus rose from the dead, at least according to Otangelo. And if Otangelo says it, it must be true. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I know. So one thing from the start I want to say is we are going into this with the purpose of debunking it. So we have some bias. When we looked at this, we're like, this is fake. Um, so we, we have that lens that we're looking through. Now, that doesn't yeah. mean that we can't be objective and look at evidence and say, oh my gosh, maybe there is something to this. And so maybe there was something to it. We'll find out. But Definitely, I found some uh, results I wasn't expecting. Yeah. So hopefully everyone will get something out of this. I, I will say the shroud has been brought up in the comment section of pretty much every debate I've ever done. Yeah. And no matter what <laughs> the topic is, the shroud of Turin shows up somewhere. Um, and we reacted to a video about eight months ago. And like you said, we didn't think there was much to it. We didn't think it was particularly credible. So full disclosure, we didn't put a lot of effort into the video. We basically just made fun of it for an hour. And somehow that was super popular. And but people wanted us to actually spend some time debunking it. So we thought we might, you know, take a little bit of time to look into it. And holy forking shirt balls, was there a lot to look into? Yeah. So buckle up because this is going to be a two part episode. Yeah. We started doing uh, this. And like, the there's just too much stuff here to do it in there's one. There's too much. Uh, people would fall asleep. So <laughs> yeah. So we're going to be covering the radiometric dating, some other dating methods on this episode. And next week, we're going to be talking about all of the other stuff, the history, the art styles, all of the other allegedly irrefutable proofs that the Shroud of Turin is authentic. I'll start by saying, like, um, the one thing that we can say for certain is that even if we determine that the Shroud of Turin dates back to the time of Christ, there's nothing we can do to actually prove scientifically that it is the a shroud actual of, burial shroud actual burial of Christ, shroud of Christ right. right and that it yeah. proves he resurrected that we we can yeah. certainly disconfirm that correct yeah uh but it would be impossible to confirm it but we could find evidence that's at least suggestive right it could, it could put it in that that sway right. into the thing right so so before we get into that normally we do a fallacy of the day but today that's going to be at the end of the episode so stay tuned if you want to learn about a fallacy we're going to jump right into the shroud so we've been talking about it let's tell you exactly what it is so the shroud of turin is a single piece of linen uh and you can see it up there on the screen it's 4.3 meters long by 1.1 meters long and that's 14 feet by three and a half feet for your for you americans out there <laughs> what you see on the screen is side by side it's actually one continuous piece of cloth of cloth it's just side by side so it's a little easier to see what's going on and as you can see on it are two faint brownish images of a dude who would if, if alive, would be about 170 centimeters tall or 5'7", and he's buck-ass naked. And <laughs> you can see front and back images. And so if we flip over to kind of a way to visualize this, this is a rendition from the Middle Ages sometime, maybe the Renaissance, I don't know. I just grabbed it from Google Images. But this is how it would look if you laid a body in the shroud. You'd put it down beneath the body, you'd put the body on top of it, and then wrap it over his head. So in the previous image, you saw the head and back. Imagine they're kind of next to each other like this, and that's the actual shroud. So it's a piece of linen, and the question is, when does it date to, right? That's unclear, or we're going to hopefully clear it up today, but there is some uncontested history, history that nobody disputes. Um, so even though proponents want to say it's first century, Everyone agrees that the first time it's like unequivocally for sure in history is in the 14th century. So it probably shows up in the possession of one Geoffrey de Charnay, who is a French knight. And he was actually didn't do a whole lot in his life, like from the lens of history. He wrote some books on chivalry. He went on a crusade that completely failed. He managed to get captured a couple times and then died. But according to like his contemporaries, he was like, legit he was like one of the best knights ever so i don't know what they saw and it doesn't matter though i can imagine when you go off on the crusades and you have like an utter failure like you don't do what you're supposed to do like oh man i can't go home like empty-handed like yeah 
<laughs> how to break something. And he back. didn't even <laughs> he didn't even like going like going to the big crusades for like yeah. Jerusalem or something. He went to Turkey, but <laughs> of course oh. it wasn't Turkey at the time. But anyways, uh, so in 1352 he showed up with the shroud. It's unclear where he got it. He did do that crusade in Smyrna, which is modern day Turkey. That was a few years before 1345. So maybe he got it there, but nobody knows for sure. He never said. In 1352, he had the shroud stored in a chapel he built on his lands in Loray, which is in northern France, about 150 kilometers southeast of Paris. Yep. And so that was probably the shroud, right? Definitely for sure. In 1389, the shroud was exhibited at that chapel to the public. And we know about it in part because a local bishop, uh, the Bishop of Troy, Pierre de Arquise, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing, he wrote a letter to the current anti-pope, Clement VII. So at the time, there were more than one pope. One was in France, another one was in Rome. So he wrote to the French one. And he claimed that the Shroud of Turin was, well, it wasn't the Shroud of Turin at the time. It's the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud <laughs> <laughs> was fake. He said it was fake. It was a cunningly painted uh, forgery, and he said the truth was attested by the artist who painted it. Hmm. Well, Unfortunately, he didn't say who that artist was or say anything else about it. He just like protested that it was fake, and Pope Clement the Seventh sanctioned its use as an image or representation of the shroud. So it, maybe it was in the shroud, but this is at least something like if of what the shroud would look like. Yeah, and it's and, important too. Like in Catholicism, we uh, they use icons uh, which they venerate to sort of help as like. Think of it as like a medium between you and the God. You just want to focus on when you're when you're yeah. praying. Yeah. <clears throat> like visualizing yeah. it. So uh and that kicked off a long line of venerating the shroud. Um in 1453, Geoffrey de Charnay, the awesome knight from before, his granddaughter gave the shroud to the House of Savoy, which is a noble house, and they stored it in a chapel in Chambury. That chapel immediately caught on fire. Well, not immediately. 1532, it caught on fire. As soon as the shroud went in the chapel, <laughs> boof, <laughs> it flames. Uh, that led to some damage to the shroud. It actually got so hot that the silver from the reliquary that the shroud was in melted and like drops of silver burned holes in the shroud. That's how hot it got. Okay, hot. that'll be important later. Remember that. Uh, so nuns sought to repair the shroud. They added some patches and they also added like a full size backing to the cloth that we have. So that's known as the Holland backing today. Shortly after the fire in 1578, the shroud was moved to Turin in Italy. And that's where it's been ever since. And now it has the name the Shroud of Turin because of where it's stored. And uh, in 1983, the shroud was given over to the papacy and they now own it for the foreseeable future. But it's still in Turin. But they, yes. Yeah. But they kept it in the same spot. Exactly. Yeah. It's interesting that. From the very beginning, so we don't have any historical record of the shroud prior to this guy Charnay, right? No certain historical yeah. record. So, well, next week we'll be talking about the alleged historical record and like some things that sure. proponents talk about that say it shows up, but like those are contested. This is like for sure. This is the basis. definitely yeah. And from the very start, you have people already contesting the authenticity of it, right? So, right. <laughs> literally from from like from the, from the word jump, as soon as the public could see it, somebody was saying it was fake. <laughs> the debate so. began, and we're continuing it today. So, uh, right, it's awesome. So, like you alluded to earlier, for the shroud to be authentic, it, it would be hard to demonstrate for sure that it was authentic. But at a minimum, it must come from first century Palestine because Jesus was crucified in the first century. So yeah. if the shroud itself is not first century, then clearly it could not have been Jesus's shroud, right? And the image itself, uh, this is maybe perhaps less certain, but it can't be super, it can't be natural in origin. So like if it's a painted image or there's like some clear natural explanation, then it would be perhaps it was, you, you might be able to say it was Jesus' shroud and they put that on afterwards, yeah. but it would certainly significantly weaken the case. So if it's not first century, is not the shroud of, of Christ. If the image is not supernatural in origin, probably not, right? And so we're going to be looking at both of those. Today, though, we're mostly going to be focusing on that. Is it from the first century, right? So, Right. We could spend months of episodes talking about this specific thing. Like we could have a whole podcast and a whole, whole channel. <laughs> Just the Shroud of Turin. So we're not going to do that. Well, but we are going to talk about the, the most yeah. plausible things we found. Yeah. If you so, want to go down the rabbit hole, though, there's a website called Shroud.com. And you can see the months and months and months and months and years yeah. of stuff that people have already done for this. Yeah, that is run by a photographer who is part of the group that we're about to talk about. Yeah. So Barry, Barry Schwartz. Schwartz. 
Yeah, very passionate about this thing. So speaking of the scientific group, scientific examinations of the shroud have been going on for many, many years, maybe centuries. But one of the most important instances was the radiocarbon dating that happened in the late 80s. And that was done by the Shroud of Turin Research Group, or STERP. And the, not a great acronym. That's what they call themselves. I didn't make it up. So I bet they had t-shirts. I don't Maybe. <laughs> Uh, they seem like very serious people. They've published a paper and everything. So real briefly, for those who may not be aware of what radiocarbon dating is, basically there's the stuff in the air. It's carbon-14. It's radioactive. It's produced in the atmosphere by cosmic rays. Living creatures, whether plants or animals, whatever, breathe in the air, which has this carbon-14 in it, so it gets inside you. You are partially radioactive, in part because of this carbon-14. But when you die, you stop breathing. I didn't look that up. I just knew it off the top of my head. And so the C14 stops getting replenished in your body. And so it's just decays away from there, right? And so we can look at a body or the remains of anything, any biological thing, and see how much carbon-14 is there now. And we can project backwards because we know how much carbon-14 there was in the past. And we also know the rate at which it decays. So we can say how much carbon-14 there was, or, or sorry, the age, how long it's been since it stopped breathing, basically. And, uh, and that's radiocarbon dating. Radiocarbon dating, though, gets a bad rap too, particularly in um, the theist community because it's reported like, oh, you can't date the Earth. And people just think that carbon-14 dating is the only kind of dating there is. Right. Uh, but when it goes to that, like you're using the wrong hammer to hit the nail. In this case, yeah. though, this is the right hammer. Because right. there's this a certain is, time frame. That, right? right. Radiocarbon dating is best for things that are 50,000 years or less. If you get a really good sample with pristine conditions, you can, might be able to push it back to 60,000 years. There's just not very much carbon-14 left after that yeah. amount of time. But for something like this, which is at most 2,000 years old, perfect for radiocarbon dating. Right. It's made of linen, which is plant material. So... You, there's a biological sample and it's well under that threshold. Perfect for carbon-14 yeah. dating. Now, it's important to remember that the sample has to be very thoroughly cleaned and prepared before it's tested. So they're like, they, they basically, depending on the type of, of radiocarbon dating they're doing, they're like, burn it up essentially, carbonize everything, right? But you want to remove anything that wasn't original to the sample. So like, uh, say you tried to date something from 5,000 years ago. But somebody was sloppy and like spilled some of their sandwich on it. It's got a big lot of peanut butter. <laughs> it's like, right. Yeah. That peanut butter is from last week. And so if you just dated it without cleaning it, uh, you'd get a lot of modern, modern carbon in it and you would get an erroneously uh, young, young day. age. Yeah. Right. And so obviously there's no like gloves of peanut butter sticking to the samples. They're very careful with them, but they do go through a very rigorous cleaning procedure before they treat them. So that's how radiocarbon dating works. And for the shroud, they uh, convinced the church to let them cut away a small portion of the shroud. So up on the screen, you can see this image. It's in like the bottom left-hand corner. This is kind of zoomed in. And there were four lab, or sorry, three labs involved. There was a lab in Arizona, one in Oxford, and one in Zurich. You can see that each lab got a piece. Arizona got two because their top piece was a little bit smaller than everyone else's. So they got a little piece at the bottom. There was a reserve that like the church kept on just in case they needed it later. And the Reyes, that was like another piece that had been taken off prior to all this happening for other reasons. Okay. Uh, so the church allowed them to take one sample here. They wanted to like take samples from all over, but they weren't allowed to do that. And, but they worked with what they had. They, their goal was to see if the image had been painted, but in addition to that, they were going to date it. And so the dating results were published in Nature in 1989. The name of the paper and all of our sources for all the papers we reference will be in the description, so you can check them all. Uh, but this paper was Radiocarbon Dating of the Shroud by Donahue et al. And they said in their conclusions that the shroud was from between 1260 or 1390 CE. In other words, it was from the Middle Ages, so it was definitely a forgery. Case closed. What, right? what, what year did that Charmé guy show up on the scene? <laughs> uh, <laughs> sometime in that in that time frame, was it? Was it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, case definitely very much not close. <laughs> we found out. Yeah. So that was that definitely upended uh, shroud research at that time. Uh, basically convinced 
the secular world that, okay, case closed. It's a forgery. We don't need to look at this anymore. But obviously that wasn't convincing for everybody, right? Well, as you do, as one does, when you're invested in something, you have to come up with an ad hoc right. rationalization. So, Well, to be I'm fair, joking, but yeah, there were some discrepancies to be found. So yeah. if you look at the original paper, while they do give that date range of 1260 to 1390, it makes it that sound represent like all within that, right? Right. Yeah. Like all the labs came with that. But actually, that's not the case. So this is a picture from a different paper, Casabianca, uh, but it shows kind of what all the ages are here. Uh, so at 1260 to 1390 shows the max and min of the ages. But here you can see that while Arizona and Zurich are kind of on top of each other, Oxford is over to the side. Not that far off, but doesn't quite overlap with anybody else. Okay. And uh, you can see just so you understand what's going on on the screen, on the bottom you've got 530, 580. Those are dates before present. And present for radiocarbon dating is defined as 1950 for reasons I'm not going to go into. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but the important thing to take away is Zurich and Arizona overlap. Oxford does not. It's a little bit off to the side. Gotcha. Okay. So this was noticed right away. And uh, people were wondering about it for a long time. In 2012, the paper of regression analysis with partially labeled regressors, carbon dating of the Shroud of Turin, great title, very catchy, was published in Statistics and Computing by Riani et al. And the researchers there used very fancy math to show that the results between the labs were heterogeneous, which means they don't match, as opposed to homogeneous, which means they'd be like all looking at the same thing, right? And so their results said there was a systemic bias between the labs, which is bad. You don't want systemic bias, right? <laughs> uh, interestingly, as kind of a, a prop up to their method, the paper didn't, the paper they were examining, the one in Nature, didn't say where like, all of these samples, these measurements were from. The labs later released all of their raw data, so now that is known. But at the time Riani was doing their work, that was not known. And so they did a bunch of modeling to like figure out where all the measurements were taken on the shroud samples. And as they were looking at it, they were like, wait a minute, it looks like Arizona only tested one of their two samples, which is a surprise because everyone just kind of assumed that they used everything they were given. They never said they didn't, or like it wasn't in the paper right. or anything. And after they had done their research, they like reached out to someone who had a sample and they said, yes, in fact, Arizona only did do one. So it was kind of a nice validation of their method. Um, but the important thing is that they reported a systemic bias uh, between the different labs, which means that there was something actually wrong with the analysis. It wasn't just the normal variation you get. There was some kind of error uh, of some sort. So. So if you're somebody uh, who's trying to hold on to the first century dating, this would be good stuff for you, right? For sure. I mean, it de and it definitely shows that the results <laughs> are questionable. Yeah. But there's questionable, then there's questionable, right? Like, <laughs> how questionable is questionable? So the, the actual bias they found was that if you, the age varied by how close you were to the center. So you saw in that picture from before, the samples were like vertically stacked. Yes. Right? I'll put it so you up. could draw a core. So you can see there. The, they're vertically stacked, their zone at the top. If you kind of track it up, they'll get younger as you go. Um, they'll get more closer to the present as you go up towards the center. And so you might think, oh, this means that like the fabric is actually younger in the center. But what it is, it seems, is has to do with like which order. The ones that, that found the older ages were at the outside, and that's because of the differences between the lads, which we're about to get into. So uh, later, Another paper working off of Riani's results, uh, Lazaro publishing in Entropy, which is a statistics journal. It's important to keep in mind what the journal is that they're focusing on. We'll touch on that in a bit. So they talked about, uh, they were comparing the inter-lab comparisons with intra-lab comparisons. So intra, meaning within the lab, they found all of the results were consistent. Like, so the, the, the results within one lab were not all over the place, but the results between labs were not specifically, like we said before, Oxford was off to the side. They mentioned this might have something to do with differences in cleaning, which brings us to Walsh and Schwalb. They published an instructive interlaboratory comparison, a 1988 radiocarbon dating of the Shroud of Turin in the Journal of Archaeological Science reports in 2020. So great, perfect journal for this, right? Archaeologist looking at this thing. It sounds riveting. And, yeah. Oh, it was, let me tell you, I have learned more in the past couple of weeks about how linen exposed to heat <laughs> reacts and by God, everyone is going to hear about it. 
So, <laughs> so they looked at the different lab results and they basically highlighted a few important facts. As we mentioned before, Zurich and Arizona are homogeneous taken together with Oxford the heterogeneous, okay? But it wouldn't take much contamination to make these uh, results not match up. If you added 88 years of age, which is not a big jump, it would bring them completely in line, but just 10 years of age added to Oxford would remove the heterogeneity. So they would so have slightly different- like this and go, whoop. Yeah. yeah, so 88 years makes them completely overlap, 10 years makes them overlap enough that they'd be in agreement. And just for some context of how much that would be, to get 88 years of movement, 1.2% of the carbon by weight would need to be 18th century. Um, and if it was from the 20th century, 0.7% of the contaminant would need to be, 0.7% of the carbon would need to be contaminant. And remember, the shroud through its entire history hasn't like been kept in a sealed box. Like people have been like touching it and pawing it and like, you know, handling peanut it. Peanut butter sandwiches while they're taking pictures of it. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it wouldn't take much uh, contaminant in order to nudge the ages just that little bit. Also, they noted there was a difference in cleaning procedures between Oxford and the other two labs. Specifically, Oxford used petroleum ether in their pre-cleaning, and Zurich and Arizona did not. So per Walsh, quote, PET ether, meaning petroleum ether, is an effective solvent for lipids and waxes and other hydrocarbon co compounds, and we postulate that Oxford was successfully able to remove a portion or perhaps all of a contaminant in one of these classes that Zurich and Tucson, Arizona, were not, end quote. And then they proposed a way that you could test to see if that was the case. Uh, they, all, they further mentioned that there has been like microscopic examinations of these things and no... Um, contamination has been seen, but the level of contamination that we need is so minuscule, it could be missed by a microscope. Right. So basically what we have here is they've done these tests to show that even though it seemed at first that there was maybe a linear progression, which kind of maybe caused into question the dating age, you know, when you only have three labs, you know, the chances of them being stacked like this versus like this, it could have easily been right. way. And if we had like 50 samples, that would, and they were all lined up like that, that would be even more uh, plausible. Right. But you had pointed out something, and right? Walsh and Schwab actually put this on a graph. So this is from their paper. And you can see there is a slope, right? But if you actually look at the points, Zurich and Tucson are like right next to each other. The reason there's a slope is because Oxford is all the way off to its own over there, right? Right. So you've got point, and these are horizontal. So if you removed Oxford, it would just be a straight line this way. But because Oxford's there, it goes this way, right? Yes. Yeah, so. so so while there is technically a slope, it's not telling you, okay, the age is getting younger. It's telling you one of these is not like the other. Right. And the reason it's not like the other is because they had a different cleaning procedure. And that very plausibly could have been 0.7% better at cleaning one of the contaminants. And there you go. You also have to remember this was done in 1988. And we have gotten, we being the scientific community, not me, uh, have gotten much, much better at radiocarbon dating. Well, so speaking of yeah, radiocarbon dating in the scientific community, I'm a layman. I don't know much about this. You don't particularly practice with you know radiocarbon dating or carbon dating or radiometric dating. That's the term, right? Radiometric dating. Radiometric dating, right? But what would somebody who actually does you know think about this? Well, funny you should ask because I reached out to a geochemist friend of mine who does do radiometric dating as part of his job all the time, mm -hmm. and uh, his name is Age of Rocks on Twitter. So he's part great of the name. science friends. Yeah, great. So he's part of the science friends community. You can look him up. And I asked him, I gave him these papers and I was like, hey, here's what I'm getting from it. But I want to make sure that like I'm not being biased when I draw these conclusions. And so I asked him to look at it. And he said that his impression was that they were kind of making a mountain out of a molehill. It's they're making a lot out of very little. He said if these were any other historical or geological sample, Nobody would care. They'd be completely happy with this level of agreement. <laughs> it would be fine. Uh, so he said, like, these results are problematic if you need to nail it down to the decade. It's so, like, if you it, you can't use these results to say, well, it's 1260 versus 1280. You know, that, these results, you couldn't quite tell, right? But we don't need to narrow it down to a decade. We need to narrow it down to, is it first century or not first century? And he said, it, it's not first century. The, the amount of contamination you would need completely off the charts here. So like with the 
radiometric date results that we have, we can't confidently state where in that 1260 to 1300 range it is. I'm inclined to think it's probably um, closer to 1260 because it seems like Oxford did a better job, but you know, whatever. We can't say what decade, but we can definitely say from this that the thing they tested was not first century. So, but the thing they tested, Jordan, what if they just tested a patch? Right. Right. That is the next step that came up. Well, the, uh, uh, we're telling like a narrative story. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of these things came up at the same time. Yeah. Right. And we've but seen enter patches the, on it in the, the picture we had. Right? Yes. And so <clears throat> it does have patches. As we mentioned, there was a fire and there are patches that the, the nuns did when they were putting on that backing cloth, the Holland cloth, they patched it. And like, you can obviously see there are some patches. So the idea there'd be a patch on it is obviously not crazy. There are patches on it. And perhaps inspired by that, Sue Benford, who was a, uh, was a nurse, I, I think she's passed. Um, I, one of them is still alive. Doesn't matter. Immaterial. So Sue Benford, who is, who is a nurse, and her husband, Joseph Marino, who holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Theological Studies, and he calls himself a syndenologist, which I had to look up. That means someone who studies a Shroud of Turin. So, <laughs> so there you go. Not an official thing, I don't think. So unsurprisingly, they were not satisfied with these radiometric dating results. And they observed that the pieces that they cut off were from the very edge of the shroud all the way in the corner, and that they were near an area of damage. Uh, if we pull up the image from where the samples came from again, you can see the little swatch there. Like you can see that there's some bits fraying. There, there's been some fire damage there, right? So, uh, and because of that, they concluded or asserted at least after looking at images, pictures, so they didn't have the shroud in front of them, they looked at pictures, JPEGs, from when the STIRP team did their work, and they decided this is a patch. And so the patch itself is medieval. Maybe, I think they said 16th century, so like from the fire, right? And so since the patch was medieval and they tested the patch, or some mixture of patch and not patch, that yielded an erroneously old or young age when in fact, it is a first century cloth. And yeah. among other things, they claimed they could see obvious slices in the threads, splices, where they had like mingled together old and new threading is what they claimed. That sounds plausible. It's it's not crazy on the face of it, right? It's worth, worth examining. Now, it is also worth pointing out, though, that it's not like the STIRP team was just like, oh, we got this right, where we go? I don't know, here looks good, and just kind of ripped it up, right? <laughs> they, they actually put some work in to make sure they were getting a good sample away from areas of obvious damage. And they had two experts of textile specifically who were on hand who helped choose the site. And they were trying to avoid patches and places of damage and things like that. Also, and so they were trying to avoid cutting the face of Jesus, right? Right. <laughs> so, so they were on hand to assist in identifying a good test site that was acceptable to the church. I can just imagine but like that, a test was like, I want to cut right here. Like, nope, can't test there. Like, <laughs> no, no. How about the hand? You don't, he's got two of them, you <laughs> yeah. know? <laughs> so Benford and Marino, though, insist that, okay, yeah, so they have the guys on hand, but this patch is actually an invisible mending patch. So it's so cunningly woven. The people at the time were so talented that it's indistinguishable to the from with the eye from the original linen. Because when okay. you look at it, there's no patch there. It's, yeah, it's when you look like, at it, it looks the same, right? There's a patch next to saying, it. But they're saying if you if um it, it it's very exceptionally well done, this patch, so much so that you can't see it. Okay, but it's there. So more importantly than Sue Bedford and her husband, Ray. Rogers was a chemist who had been involved with the STIRP project. He worked on it. He was one of the people that helped with the various testings. He got notified, I believe, by Barry Schwartz of these claims, and he looked into them, and he expected to, quote, debunk them in minutes. He was going to throw them out. But he actually became convinced they were right. Now, he didn't think the shroud was authentic. He, he died in 2005, and uh, he went to his grave believing this was an authentic. He has like a whole manifesto where he's like yes it's first century but here's all the reasons why it's fake right but he was convinced that uh it was an invisible patch and so he published in 2005 a paper in thermochemica acta which is like a chemistry journal uh but it was a journal where he had been an editor for a long time he had retired from it but he was like had worked with this journal for decades dibs right? on band name by the way so. yeah there you go <laughs> 
<laughs> so uh, shortly after he published his paper, he succumbed to cancer. But uh, after his death, his results were hailed as like definitive proof that the SERP team, they'd gotten it wrong. The, like regardless of what those radiocarbon dates say, like this is a ancient piece of cloth, right? And so the paper is titled Studies on the Radiocarbon Sample from the Shroud of Turin. And in it, Rogers argues for two main points. First, the radiocarbon sample was not part of the original shroud, so it was a patch, right? And secondly, the shroud itself, uh, he gave a test to determine that the shroud itself, away from the place where the, the sample was done, is old, older than the radiocarbon age is. So, which is look important at those too, because even if that was a patch, it could have been patched 10 years after the original was made, right? That Yeah, that's a good point. Like, so even if they could demonstrate this is a patch. So, like, basically, they'd have to demonstrate you've got the, the probability that this is like a patch and also the probability that the rest of it is not is not ancient, right? right. So, yeah, it's definitely a two-step program. But let's start with the first one. He claimed to show that this, basically, the patch mat patch material is not the same as the rest of the shroud. Okay, and so to show this, he analyzed the pyrolysis, pyrolysis mass spectrometry, which they done. It's a fancy way of saying they lit some stuff on fire and then watched the light that came out. And if you do that, the wavelengths of the light will tell you um, what um, elements and stuff are in there. So you can infer what is making up the sample, right? So... Uh, the fibers that they used for this originally have been taken off using sampling tape. So like tape, just like you might take lint off a suit. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Just patting it down. Right. And so uh, he believed these results showed that the shroud, the area that had been tested had been colored with a thing called gum Arabic and that they had done this in order to yellow the fiber. So it would look like the rest of the shroud because it does look like the rest of the shroud. So he has to explain that. Right. So linen, as we alluded to before, it's made from plants. And that means it's largely consisting of cellul cellul cellulose. And cellulose produces, get ready for this, hydrozymethyl furfoil, which is mass number 126. So I'm going to throw th this chart up on the screen uh, that he puts in his paper. And what you're seeing here are the mass spectrum. So those are the atomic numbers of the things the M over Z numbers of the things that showed up. All you need to know is taller column means more of that stuff. Okay. So the cellulose produces that hydro stuff that shows up on mass 126. And that in turn produces fur for all for, I'm going to call it furf uh, <laughs> at mass 96. Okay. But that, that doesn't happen until it reaches high heat. He never says what high is. Okay. So there on the screen, you see the high heat one with a peak of some sort around 96, 97, and another one in the 126 range, okay? So that's if that's if the FERF is coming from cellulose. So this other one is low heat. And he said pentosins, which are present in gum Arabic, they also produce FERF, but it's not coming from the cellulose, so you won't have the 126 spike. And so you can see here, there's no signal at 126, but there is a signal around 97. Thus, according to Rogers, boom, case closed. Furf is in the area, not produced by cellulose, and that means gum Arabic is there. Therefore, it was colored with gum Arabic. Therefore, it's not the same as the rest of the shroud. Case closed, right? Case closed, yet again, or not. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, this, and like I said, his paper was like hailed and is still today in many different sources. Like, Rogers, shut the, the door on this. I've seen people go so far as to say that we should throw out the radiometric dating because of what Rogers said. Okay. I think Michael Kona has said something to that effect. I may not be. So I know we're getting ready to go into this, but just at first glance, my layman stuff. I've read quite a few scientific journals. Usually when they're talking about a procedure that they do, they kind of outline their, their methods. Uh, one of those methods would be the amount of heat that needs to be applied when you say <laughs> high heat, right? Yeah, uh, not so much with Rogers. So uh, in 2015, a paper was published in that same journal, Thermochemica Acta, by Bella et al. And it was titled, There is no mass spectrometry evidence that the C14 samples from the Shroud of Turin comes from a medieval invisible mending. 
that's the title of the paper. So you don't even need to read it. Kind of, <laughs> kind of giving away the 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 clue there, the conclusion yeah. they came to. Um, so that paper sparked a response, which they then responded to. Uh, so I'm gonna while the response, the person who wrote the response was Latender say, and he quibbled with some details. For instance, uh, Bella called the the thing that he's gonna find a contaminant. But Latendra say was like, well, it might have been like on the shroud for centuries, which means it would be part of the sample and not a contaminant, technically. So, so okay, it's like those kind of quibbles. Right. But he actually spends most of his paper criticizing the, the methods of Rogers. So I'm just going to lump all three of their results together to tell you what, what happened. Uh, so between those three papers, Bella points out that the specimens from one of the samples, sample A, were collected via adhesive tape. And while Rogers doesn't say this here, in other places where he's retelling the story and talking about it, he says that the threads have to be like removed from the tape and laboriously clean with a certain solution. But the other two samples did not get that cleaning. So that alone shows a, a very different history between the two samples. And that could uh, indicate that that could be enough to explain any difference in their mass spe uh, spectrums. Right. So right off the jump, you couldn't draw conclusions based on this result. Right. Uh, further, he points out, and actually, Latendre say points this out as well, that Roger's entire hypothesis, the thing with the gum Arabic being present at 96, but the cellulose has 126 to 96, and that's like indicative, right? Is presented in his paper with absolutely no citations or backup whatsoever. Roger just wants us to take his word for it. He just, this is the way it is, and that's it. Now, Latendre say like points to another paper that like, maybe might allude to it, but as Bella pointed out in his response to the response, uh, that paper says nothing about mass spectrums or dating or anything. And, you know, so like, this is just basically just a word from, from Rogers as an authority. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but Rogers doesn't give us any reason to think it's true. Um, Bella points out further that the different spectra could just as easily come from a hydrocarbon containing contaminant. And they like give an example of a specific contaminant that has a similar like signature. Mm -hmm. And if you like did so you can't just straight like subtract, but if you did the necessary procedure to remove one signal from another, then the two suddenly look pretty similar. So Bella concludes <clears throat> quote, the work of the late Dr. Rogers has been exploited to support a pseudoscientific hypothesis, which is in no way confirmed by the reported data. Regardless of the debate on the hypothetical authenticity of the shroud, the scientific community and the general public can only be misled by this paper, end quote. Pretty blatant, yeah, <laughs> which is uh... unusual in a, uh, in a peer-reviewed paper. In addition to Bella and that whole thing, Another group also looked at it in 2010. This was Fear Waters and Joel, and they published an examination of Rogers' work at, in 2010. And they examined the shroud and they consulted with Ann Hudland, who is the director of the Gloria F. Ross Center for Tapestry Studies. She's an anthropologist and an expert in tapestries, like an expert in this specific thing. Imagine consulting an expert when you, wow. yeah. when you need help, right? So what they did was they examined pieces of the shroud that were left over from the stirp dating. So like we mentioned, there was the reserve, Arizona, but more importantly, Arizona didn't test their second piece, right? And so uh, they looked at that at the pieces they had, which had a clear chain of custody all the way from when they were kept in 1988. One of the authors, Joel, had like had this in their possession the whole time. So clear chain of custody. And uh, rather than summarizing it, I'm just going to read the paper. The, the thing because they, they, they put it beautifully. In addition, we find no evidence for any coatings or dyings of the linen. Remember that Rogers said that the gum Arabic dye had would yeah. have matched the colors. Rogers in 2005 suggested that the fibers in his study, which came from the Reyes fragments, were coated with a matter root dye and mordant. Linen does not readily accept dye, and any surface coating would be loosely adhered. We viewed a textile fragment dyed using traditional methods under UV light and observed absolutely no similarity in UV fluorescence consistent with such a dye. So they looked at a piece of linen that they dyed to like test this hypothesis, and the two were completely different. Okay. <clears throat> they continue. Rogers and others assert that the Reyes and the radiocarbon samples he studied are dyed in contrast to the main part of the shroud. Um, but as stated by Rogers, no other part of the shroud shows such a coating. 
We find no evidence to support the contention that 14 carbon samples actually used for measurements are dyed, treated, or otherwise manipulated. Hence, we find no reason to dispute the original carbon-14 measurements since our sample is a fragment cut on the arrival of the Arizona sample in Tucson and held in custody by Jewel. I would say it's pretty clear cut that this whole patch concept is kind of... if So if it is a patch, it would have to be such that the mass spectrum is the same, right? Because we can't say from Roger's work the mass spectra are different. So we have to set that to the side because there's flaws in his analysis, mm -hmm. okay? Flaws that are significant to sink his whole hypothesis, okay? We also, the dye would have to be such that it would change the color of the fabric, but not look anything like dyed linen that we can observe because that's what Free Waters and Jolt did with consultation of a tap, a anthropologist who is an expert in tapestries. So this expert in this very specific niche field found examined the tapestry work the the linen under a microscope looked at everything and said there's no evidence of a patch whatsoever so it can be difficult to prove a negative sometimes so perhaps there's a patch that's just like so amazingly good not only is it the same mass spectra? Not only does the dye not show up under UV light, not only is it not available on a microscope, like, like, like this is like crazy old patches, but like zooming that out a little bit, and Bella mentioned this, like before the radiocarbon dating, literally nobody said anything about a patch, including like textile experts who had examined the shroud in person for decades. Absolutely nobody thought that this area had was subject to a patch. patch. It only showed up as an explanation once carbon-14 data engaged something that was inconvenient, right? And kind of, you mentioned the patches earlier, there are patches on the shroud that are closer to the image, right? Because it was burned all over. So there are patches that are like, we're done. And they are obviously patches that you can see them with the naked eye. They're clearly not the same. Which either were done at the same time or before. Right. And so we're supposed to believe that the people, the nuns who had access to this patching technology, when it was near the image and like more central and therefore more important, they did like the crappy slap job patches, but they got like the Da Vinci of patching to like do this completely <laughs> inconsequential yeah. area in the corner, such as like such a perfect job that was like by modern technology in indistinguishable, like, come on, you know, it, it's, that's just impossible. This one nun's like, I got this new patching technique. I think I might try it out in the corner, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. And then they saw it and they're like, that looks pretty good, but eh, the yeah, other ones, ones are done, fine. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, in order to explain it, you have to believe all those things, which just doesn't seem plausible, right? So let's move on to the second of Roger's assertion. He says that the other parts of the shroud are ancient, which is kind of more important, right? So to prove that the shroud is quite old, he looked at the fibers or some of the fibers that were collected. And these fibers contain something called lignin, which is an organic polymer, and it supports plant tissue. And in lignin, it includes vanillin, which is an organic compound present in many plants. You probably know it best from being in the vanilla bean. So that's where you get like vanilla flavoring from. This vanillin decays over time after the plant dies um, and is particularly sensitive to heat. It's exponentially so. So like storing at 20 degrees, if you store it a few degrees more, it's not going to like, it's not a linear relationship, but it's an exponential relationship, right? So the hotter it is, the more it decays exponentially, okay? So Rogers looked at fibers from various parts of the shroud, and he noted that no vanillin or virtually no vanillin could be seen on any of them. Um, and he states, he asserts, that it would take 2,000 years at 23 degrees Celsius to lose all the vanilla, right? Um, and if it had been produced in 1260, the shroud should retain 37% of its vanilla sort of those temperatures, okay? Case closed. Yeah, it's old. <laughs> right. So there's some problems with this, obviously. As uh, Bell kind of noted, he doesn't really, like, give you a method for how he determined any of this. He just says that he, like, looked at them and basically could see it. But so the methodology is, would be hard to reproduce. But more importantly, the major problem is that, as Rogers himself says, the major, he's, this is a quote from Rogers, the major problem in estimating the age of the shroud is the fact 
that the rate law is exponential, i.e. the maximum diurnal temperature is much more important than the lowest storage temperature. Okay, so the hot te highest hottest it's ever been is far more important, or the hottest the hottest it gets is more important than how it's like stored regularly. Right. right? I mean, for example, you could have had it in a wood chest that was in direct sunlight all day long, and it was just super hot in there. But right. that wouldn't matter at all if it was exposed to I don't know a fire. Yeah, if maybe like the building it was in <laughs> caught fire, the fire and it would was have like made a bigger impact on it, right? Right. Yeah. And it was like so hot that silver in the box it was in was melting and burning holes in <laughs> That's the pretty shroud. hot, you know? Yeah. Seems like it'd be pretty hot, right? Yeah. So Rogers doesn't, to his credit, doesn't ignore this, but he asserts that because linen has a low thermal conductivity, the entire shroud wouldn't have heated up enough, uh, by a bunch. And so like he points basically like there's color differences at the burn areas, but like it doesn't, the whole coloring of the shroud is not like he heated up or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and therefore, no impact to the vanillin. And to support that that claim, he gives absolutely nothing. No data, no experiment, no paper, no nothing. He just says it. So, like, he doesn't say, like, it would have needed to get to this temperature in order to de to destroy this much vanillin. Uh, here's where I did a thing with the shroud. Like, like, nothing. He does absolutely no work whatsoever to support this assertion. He just says it. And that which can be stated without evidence. Right. <laughs> so the fact that this linen was exposed to a fire sufficient to burn holes in the tapestry at some point, I think should be enough to completely table the entire vanillin argument on its own. Unless and until actual rigorous experimentation is done that shows basically his point the point he was trying to make is there's no vanillin everywhere and a fire would have impacted things unevenly. But if the fire was such that it got rid of all of it, then that'd be it, right? right. It would it's, all be gone. gone. <laughs> yeah. 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 Plus even like beyond that, like we, the, the shroud, like we said, has not been kept in temperature controlled areas. It's entire history, you know, if, if, before it showed up in this French knight's possession, who knows <laughs> what was done to it, right? It could have been anything, yeah. literally anything. We have no record, uh, no firm record anyway. So yeah, this is a very tenuous assumption to begin with, which is completely destroyed by the fact that there was in a bloody fire. <laughs> and therefore it's not a reliable way of, of, um, of testing, right? So to summarize this whole thing with the radiocarbon dating, the radiocarbon dating does have discrepancies that it definitely does. The radiocarbon dating results in the 80s have discrepancies. They have a systemic bias between different labs that appears to be because of a difference in procedure with one of the labs versus the other two. Because the other two labs match very well. One of the labs doesn't quite match, but the difference is very small. And so with just a tiny bit of contamination that one lab was better at getting rid of than the other, that would be enough to explain the differences and regardless of the minor differences between this lab or that lab while you can't nail down a specific decade we can say pretty securely that the piece they tested is not from the first century and, and yeah <laughs> so that that's enough right there the piece they yeah. tested is the key part right uh, the piece we, they tested would we and, like to have had pieces tested off we'd like to burn the whole thing up test the whole thing so that would be the sure. best possible outcome i mean if i i'd just like cut an outline around the, the, the thing you know like yeah yeah, <laughs> test, test test the whole rest yeah. Of it. yeah 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 right. but so. that's not gonna happen so okay so that's that's the radiocarbon dating the invisible patch hypothesis doesn't hold up to scrutiny there, it's it's has all the hallmarks of an ad hoc assertion just thrown out there in order to save it from this method and, and the okay. assertions create more problems that you then have to solve with more ad hoc right research, so so therefore we should reject it. So speaking of dating methods, one last addendum to the dating saga. In 2019, in the journal Heritage, there was an article called X-ray dating of ancient linen fabrics by DeCaro et al. And they were proposing a new method of testing old linen, okay? Old tapestries and things like that. And basically it has to do with, uh, they hit it with X-rays and look at the scattering angle to determine the degradation of the linen and infer from that rate of de that degradation how long it's been degrading 
that gives you an H, right? Kind of similar to the Vinoin thing is, but it's not destructive is one of the big selling points of this uh, analysis, right? So they proposed it in 2019 and in 2022, same people, same journal published the article X-ray dating of a Turin Shroud's linen sample. And lo and behold, it's first century. Wouldn't you know? Wow. <laughs> oh. So here's the takeaway for this thing. Some, some key points that should jump out at you. First of all, this is a brand new method. And I also put this to uh, Age of Rocks. I asked him his input on this piece too. And so this was the uh, input he gave. Wait, this is a brand new method. It's only been since 2019, so that's three years ago. And so far as I can tell, nobody else has vetted it. I looked for papers that had cited this paper. Some people have cited it and they basically said, this looks interesting, but nobody had like used it for any other purpose. Nobody had tested to see if it's actually accurate. Nobody had like done any kind of bounding, like the heat, how is that gonna affect degradation? Don't know, like they do some testing. They like put some tapestry in an oven for at 200 degrees Celsius to like test its impacts. So like they tried to quantify that, but nobody else has examined the results, right? So this is a brand new method. Maybe it'll work out. If it did, awesome. But maybe it won't too, right? As of right now, this is because it's a new method, it lacks rigorous calibration. And so given this brand new method used by one person based or one group of people, for they made it specifically to test the trap. Obviously, that that is what they did. Um, so one new method that's brand new, not tested. We've got that on one hand. And then we've got radiocarbon dating, which has been used for decades by labs all across the world, you know, extremely well vetted. We should weight one of these things more heavily, right? Especially since one was created for the sole purpose of finding a date for the first century. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> And so, like, and I'm, that's not me being pejorative. Like, you only have to look at the publishing history of these people, these other, these researchers. If you look at some of the other papers they published, they published a paper on uh, the blood on the shroud. And they alleged that they could determine that it was, uh, had experienced trauma. So, like, the blood of the, the person who, who bled had been tortured in some way. Right. And they claim they could see that in there. And the reason that would be important is because, like, if it was a forgery, I mean, human blood's not exactly hard to come by. Right. But perhaps blood from somebody you tortured is. Right. Yeah. That's the the idea. But their paper, which was uh, they attempted to publish in plus one, was retracted, meaning it was found wanting. It was like they published it and it was flawed enough that they had to, like, pull it back. It's like, oopsie, not so much. And some of the things that they mentioned was that. All of their testing for this entire thing came down to a single fiber. They tested one fiber and drew these conclusions, which is exactly what they did with the x-ray testing too. They tested one fiber and said, therefore, it's, it's first century. So apparently, not only are they motivated to find a first century date, like that happened in 2017, it got retracted, that didn't work. So then they found another method, right? And they didn't learn from the mistake that led to their paper being retracted because they once again used a single strand. And we're not saying that this method couldn't be feasible or couldn't give a accurate. We just don't have enough information at this point. Right. And their track record is leaning more towards like. Right. Yeah. So as skeptics, it's important to hold all our conclusions lightly. So if new evidence comes to light, if new P if the, um, scientific community examines this method, vets it, figures out all the kinks, you know, works out the nuts and bolts so it becomes reliable, they're testing it everywhere and it works, and then they go back to the shroud and like, there it is, first century? Okay, well then that would be new information, right? But given what we know now, it's good to know, but not uh, something I'd lean on, right? So that's the dating uh, topic uh, finished. We've got so much more left, which is why we're going to leave that, leave that for next week. Yeah. So next week, we're going to be talking, among other things, we're going to be talking about how was the image made. Yeah. So there's some hypotheses around whether it's radiation or paint or whatever. It couldn't be made by any other way except for right. resurrection. But. Right. So uh, we're going to see if it has the hallmark uh, trait imprints of, of resurrection, which like I'm not sure how anyone knows that, but whatever. We'll leave that out. for next week. Yeah. 
we're going to find out. Uh, apparently, there's some pollen on it, which is a really big deal. So we're going to look at that. And we're also going to look at like some images and paintings through the years and how they allegedly like tie in to the shroud and, and any other thing that we find. Yeah, it's going to be more and, of a, some of like the smaller things that don't take as much research. This one was a, a big one with a lot of information. So. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so thanks for making it all the way in. As a reward for making it all the way to the end, you get today's fallacy of the day. Today's fallacy of the day is fallacy bingo. So uh, this one I was inspired by our friends over at Answers and Reason who were, did like an episode on fallacies, and one of the things they talked about a lot was fallacy bingo. And so fallacy bingo is kind of like an extreme case of my favorite fallacy. What's my favorite fallacy? The fallacy fallacy. The fallacy fallacy. Exactly. So the fallacy fallacy is where you say your argument's fallacious, therefore your conclusion's wrong. Which is, in fact, fallacious because you can have a fallacious argument that has a true conclusion, right? You just got right basically by accident. So fallacy bingo is kind of like that to the nth degree. Fallacy bingo is someone says something, you just say fallacy, whatever it is. Even if it's not a fallacy. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Then they say something else. Oh, fallacy. And it, like that's that's playing fallacy bingo, right? You're refusing to engage with the with the argument or the conversation, right? At the point. And this seems common in discourse online, and depressingly common among people who claim to be skeptics. They will just kind of it's kind of like they're hunting for a fallacy, and because if they see the fallacy, now I don't have to think about this anymore. I've declared I've won because you had a fallacy, therefore I win. And that's my bingo it. card said I got all the fallacies, so we're good. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So we don't have to continue. And so there's a lot of problems. First of all, it promotes the fallacy fallacy, right? Fallacious arguments can have true conclusions. So just because it's fallacious in and of itself doesn't mean it's wrong. It means the argument's flawed. It doesn't mean the conclusion's wrong. It also doesn't like help conversation in any way. So like, even if you're right, say best case scenario, they did, in fact, commit a fallacy, right? If you just say fallacy, you know, ad hominem, which is everyone's favorite, or, you know, whatever fallacy, pick your favorite one. Straw that man. Didn't, <laughs> yeah. yeah, straw man. That didn't tell them anything unless they already know what the fallacy is and they're right, right? So they, they know what the fallacy is, they are correct in that knowledge, and, like, they understand what you said, which a lot of people who aren't playing fallacy bingo don't know these, right? So you haven't actually helped anyone. So, and even worse, there's a good chance, just statistically speaking, you're wrong about the fallacy you're saying. Because <laughs> I can tell you, talking to people on the internet, people are wrong about fallacies way more than they're right. Which is why we <laughs> do the fallacy of the day, so we can educate the masses. <laughs> right. So, if you take the time to just briefly explain, hey, I think you committed this fallacy, and here's why. Here's what I think you did that is fallacious, right? That does a few things. First of all, it helps them because you have now explained to them why what they did was wrong. It shows everyone what you think the fallacy is. So if you're wrong, they can correct you. And maybe you can actually get, you can like improve the argument. You can steal man it and then get better to the truth, right? Cause that should be the goal. The goal isn't to win internet points and like declare victory. The goal is to find out what the truth is. And maybe they have like a really good argument, but there's one flaw in it and you fix that. Maybe it works now, right? So everybody wins if you do that. But. A lot of times people are just trying to point out the fallacies. They don't want to engage with the art, the conversation or the argument, or they don't want to hear what somebody else is saying. At that point, get off the internet. Yeah, you're, you're not helping anything. So see yourself out of the conversation. Anyway, uh, thanks for sticking all the way to the end. Stick around next week when we'll be doing Shroud Part 2 in the new year. Uh, but until then, remember, you've always got reason to doubt. Peace out.